Check one, two. Go! Go! Curious about real estate? Yes! Then you've come to the right place. Get the knowledge you need. Get over the fear and get started. This is the Michael Quarles Real Estate Show with your host, Michael Quarles. Hello, everybody. Michael Quarles with Podcast 113. Here we go. These are the five questions sent in by real estate investors like yourself who had a question, needed an answer. And uh, we're going to try to do that. If you have a question, send it to support at bsffacademy.com. One more time. Support at bsffacademy.com. Question number one. Once we get a house under contract, do we tell the seller that we are going to list it on the MLS? Since our prior conversation on the phone with the seller was that we were going to pay all cash, the seller might ask why we are listing it on the MLS when we said we would pay cash for their house. I don't think they have anything to do with each other. And yes, we're going to tell the seller because it says that in my contract, at least I'm going to. And um, I think it's important to be upfront, forthcoming, honest, all those good things. What we do with the property is not relevant to the seller getting our cash at the end of the day or getting somebody else's cash who we sell to on a concurrent close or simultaneous close. It really doesn't matter. As long as we meet and formalize the commitment that we made to that seller, that's all they care about. In fact, a lot of sellers say, we don't care how much money you make. We hope you make a ton. So don't worry about it too much. Question number two. I think I heard Gabriel say in a podcast that sellers with no equity can present possibilities. I'm curious if there's a strategy for purchasing from people who owe as much as their house is worth. I have a seller who is highly motivated selling through a realtor hasn't worked for them and they can't afford some of the repairs needed to list. They desperately want to get rid of the house, but they owe as much as it's worth. They were highly motivated, but I'm wondering, is there any way to structure that to make a deal for us. Well, it depends on what you're going to do with the house. And quite frankly, yes, there are some times that you can buy a house at hundred percent. I would never do that. Although there's opportunities there. I'm, I know that there's more opportunities in buying houses at 50 to 60 to 70% of value, flipping those things in an as is value, what we call wholetailing rather than buying something that's fully encumbered trying to find a buyer that's going to do a wrap because you're going to take a subject to the existing loan you're then going to do an aidt and then you're going to try to sell it you're going to inflate the price to the buyer so now you have a commitment that you've made to the original seller that you're going to make payments you're relying on someone else to make you the payment so you can make the payment you have this small little spread sure you made a little bit of down money payment money but what happens if your buyer goes sideways? Are you going to continue to make the payment on your own? What happens if the lender does call the due on sale? Are you going to be able to pay off that mortgage? And if you can't pay off the mortgage, how do you handle that with the buyer that now has that home as their own on your wrap? Or if you did a lease option on an option, you can get yourself in a lot of trouble doing these what I'm going to call squeaky, strange deals. Why don't you just buy a house at 70 or cents on the dollar or less and flip that puppy and make some good money. Question number three, in a recent show, you said that national advertisers have a big advantage over regional advertisers on Google, but I didn't understand exactly why that is. Could you review that again? Yes. Anytime that I market, say I want to market central California or I want to market Fayetteville, North Carolina, or I want to market a certain city. Google in their wisdom, even though I'm paying, I'm offering to pay to Google the same amount of money. My budget is the same. My cost per click that I'm willing to pay is the same. They are not giving me the same list. So I'm not on the same at the same level on the list because there's a lot of national advertisers that are saying to Google, hey, we want to give you $2,500 a day, which is what my national budget is on a daily basis with Google and Bing. We want to give you this money. Google looks at that and says, we want to take that money. If you're a local advertiser, Google, and even if you say to Google, we want to get 20, give you 2,500 bucks, Google knows they can't get 2,500 bucks out of you. 
but they certainly know they can get it out of the national guy. So they're going to place those national advertisers in one, two, and three, and four, far above your local. And I tell you what, I tell you what, it's all about positioning on Google pay per click. And, um, you know, when we, when we say we don't have territory marketing going on and we do national, it's just a significant difference. And you guys, we don't have to knock on the front door. You don't have to look at a house. It's nice to learn how to do that so you can elevate and transition your business into something different like never doing it. But you don't have to. So you can buy anywhere you want. Don't be afraid. I mean, if you live in a high rent or cost area, say you're in the Bay Area or, or San Diego area or New York or some area, and think, well, I can't market here because, I mean, the competition's too strict, blah, blah, blah. Well, find an area you can market to where there's the competition's not so strict and the cab costs of the properties are such that you can afford to take them down and make some good returns on them. So don't limit yourself by where you go to, but think about when you do use Google, and I only use Google, by the way, when my phone isn't ringing enough from my direct mail. And rarely does that happen, but it does. I mean, but we have to chart everything. We have, we have graphs that run off of our CRM system that tell me on a bird's eye view what each um, Alex is doing, what each Ryan's doing um, on the hour kind of thing. So I know, and I can look at my graphs, and I can say, I, I need to turn my, my paper click on. But in, I, when I do, I'm going to do it nationally. I hope that made sense. I know I rambled. Apologize. Thanks for listening to Buy, Sell, Fix, Flip. We'll be right back. Are you running out of leads? It's time you tried Yellow Letters at yellowletters.com. Get motivated seller leads through yellow letters, postcards, zip letters, typed professional letters, greeting cards, door hangers, and business cards. Yellow Letters is a full-service marketing company created with your success in mind. Get the personal attention you need to get your direct mail campaign started and get in touch at yellowletters.com. And we are back in three, three, two, two, one. one. Question number four. My market's not big enough to support a wholetailing business with a population of 2,500. The markets I intend to focus on are three hours away. A face-to-face -face seller presentation may not be realistic for every seller. How important is a face-to-face -face selling presentation and is an absolute must? Can I just do a presentation over the phone? You absolutely do the presentation on the phone. Here's what you want to do. Until you're comfortable knowing that you can do this, like absolutely no, I don't care if the seller lives in the house. I don't care if they're an absentee owner. I don't care if they're absentee in city, out of city, out of state. I don't care anything. Until you're that comfortable, market to only absentees out of area and out of state. Because they're not going to want to see you either. That helps you so much tremendously. Tremendously helps you. Because now it takes the burden off of you thinking, well, maybe they need to see me. Well, they don't want to see you. They don't want to fly or drive wherever the property is. We just bought a house. The lady lives in Alaska and her house is in Bakersfield. She doesn't want to come to Bakersfield. We, it was great. So start with that list, become comfortable. Once you're comfortable knowing that people will actually do this, then expand your list to local absentees and local owner occupants in the areas that you want to market to, but don't limit your thought process because you're wondering if it's, if you need to do this or not. We, you know, last month we wrote 48 offers on property, 48 contracts. And, you know, we'll do the same thing this month, hopefully. Uh, knock on wood kind of stuff. It looks like we will. So, you know, just know that you can do it. Great question. Question number five. What steps does an investor need to make to get his escrow money back if the market analysis comes back negative? after the purchase and sales agreement sign and security deposits are funded into escrow. Well, here's the thing. A security deposit is a promise to pay. And if you look at my agreement, it says prior to the close of escrow, the buyer will deposit into escrow or into closing the sum of, and we usually use $100. So it's a promise to pay, which solves for consideration at some point in the future. 
It doesn't say I'm going to run down and put my money in escrow today. It says prior to the close of escrow. So that means right before you buy it, you put a deposit in it. So you don't put the deposit in it if you aren't going to buy it. And you know you're, you are or you're not going to buy it based upon whatever contingencies and whatever systems that you have in place. Now, personally, we do BPO, Broker's Price Opinion, and we also do a local appraisal. So I want to make, I want to confirm my CMA for my seven data sets. I'm going to hire a realtor in the area or a broker, an agent in the area to do that BPO for me. If I can't find one at my fingertips easily, then I'm going to use one of two services that cost us a little bit more than the hundred dollars. I think they charge us 175 where I can go to that service and they have agents lined up to do BPOs for lenders. And so that's fine for me. That's all I need. But so I'm going to spend a little bit more, but that's okay. I need to confirm what I think I know based on my, my seven data sets. And then I'm still going to send out an appraiser to confirm that BPO. Now, if those come in fine, I'm going to fall forward and I'm going to close escrow and I'm going to give the escrow company whatever amount of money they need. They're going to call a hundred of it a deposit. The rest of it's um, additional monies to close escrow and we're gonna be done. If they don't come in, then I'm gonna use the contingency inside of my contract that says it didn't appraise for this value, which we said originally within the contract. As it's very important. If you have an appraisal contingency in your agreement, you must state how much value that property should appraise for. And in our case, we always have to make sure it's appraising for the hundred cents on the dollar that we think it's worth, not the value in which we're buying it for. So if you if your appraisal contingency is only geared to reflect the purchase price, you're going to be in a big trouble here. So you always make sure that you have a clause that says it must appraise for this value, which is a value greater than the purchase price, because that's what your business model says. Your business model says you're buying it at 70 cents, 60 cents, 50 cents something along those effects. So if that's the case, make sure you have that. So in the end of the day, if your BPO and your appraisal doesn't come back, you don't have any exposure because just because you did not put a deposit doesn't mean at some point you won't have legal exposure to the seller. And guys and gals, as soon as we know that we're not going to buy a house, we should let these people know. I mean, they're packing, they're getting excited. If they're absentees, they're spending their money kind of stuff on future stuff. They're, they're planning. And it, once we know, we should let them know and, and start the renegotiation. I mean, if you bought a house for 55,000 and it, you thought it was gonna be worth 100,000 and it wasn't worth 100,000, it was only worth 90,000. Well, you can cancel the contract, absolutely. As long as you have the clauses in your agreement that says you can. But why not try to renegotiate? Say, hey, it only we thought you and I, you the seller, me the buyer, thought that the house was worth a hundred. It's only worth ninety. Are you willing to go below the fifty-five to cause your house to be sold? Yes or no? Sometimes you're going to have to meet them in the middle. Sometimes you're going to have to negotiate. Sometimes you'll have to look at it and you go, well. If I'm buying at 55 and it's actually worth 90 and I know I'm going to have 8% cost or eight and a quarter percent of cost on 90. So now I'm really only going to get like 81. Well, 81 from 55 on an as is, I know I'm going to have about 500 bucks in, in cost in doing my BPO and appraisal. So now I'm not getting, you know, 81's 8,500 minus 55. I'm going to get $35,000 or $25,000. Well, is $25,000 enough for your business model? I'm going to say yes, but maybe you just still renegotiate and you meet them in the middle and instead of 25, make 30. But, but as soon as you know you're not going to do something or you need to renegotiate, do that. Nothing changes until you start taking action. And we should not let sellers think their houses are sold when we know in fact that they're not. Anyway, that's enough about that. Hey, just in case you guys didn't know, the daily deals are up every day. Some of them are some really good deals up there. I'm excited about making that money. 
We also have the Alex and Ryan scripts up by the Daily Deals. And if those of you that wanted the script and asked for it, we have it there for you to download and look at. Um, I think there's a small fee to it, but you know, that's a small fee for success. That's not bad at all. And um, I appreciate being able to do the podcast. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Michael Quarles Real Estate Show. Get more info and stay in touch at michaelquarles.com.